Hi everybody, welcome to this month's book club. And this month we're reading Women with Attention Deficit Disorder by Sari Solden. And I know what your dudes are thinking out there. I don't need to watch this because this is about women. But there's actually quite a bit that you can learn from this book and about how to have better relationships with women that have ADHD. So if you wanna hang in there, I promise you'll learn something that you didn't already know. So I love this book. Um, this book has been around for a real long time and it's also uh, has been updated. It was first published in 1995 and it was just updated uh, in 2012. I love this book because it's a real, kind of a manual guide to help people navigate a new ADHD diagnosis. And this book has like five parts to it. Today we're basically just gonna talk about one part of it, which I think is the discovery process, which is a lot of the places where we meet our clients. And I thought that would be the most helpful uh, for you guys out there in this short video. I'm Chris Scrat with Organizing Maniacs, and we are a professional organizing, consulting, and coaching company in uh, outside Washington, D.C., where we specialize in working with clients with brain-based challenges. So the majority of our clients have ADD, ADHD, a little bit of OCD and some hoarding tendencies. So if you like some support, you can find us at organizingmaniacs.com. We also put together this very simple book report. So if you like to receive this or download it, you can sign up for um, on our website. There should be a link as well on this video for you to get a copy of, um, of the report. And it's just an easy way to digest a lot of the information we try to convert the information that we read for everyday neurotypical people into information that can be easily used by anybody with adhd so the reason why i picked this book is because i was at the international conference on the adhd last year and uh sorry was there and she speaks every year and she's always such an amazing speaker and i was reminded of how good this book is so the entire Organizing Maniacs team is reading it currently just because it has so many amazing things. And of course, it is a resource that I always refer to our clients when they are newly diagnosed with ADHD because there's so much stuff in there. Um, the book is basically split up in five parts and the first part is surviving, which I think is like the discovery process of being newly diagnosed with ADHD. Um, and it speaks to where people are at before diagnosis. Uh, part two talks about hiding, which is all of the ways that we don't let the world know uh, about what's happening to our brain, uh, which talks about, you know, the w w work, uh, emotional legacy, which has a lot to do with guilt and shame. Um, it talks about the effects of it, which is, you know, depression, underachievement, low self-esteem, negative self-talk. Um, it talks about our relationships with our family and our friends, and of course our partnerships. Uh, part three talks about emerging, which has a lot of resources and tools and assessments. So it really helps people get down to, you know, how their ADHD impact their lives. Part four talks about embracing having ADHD because it is something that once you're diagnosed, it's not something that's curable. You're going to have that forever. So might as well learn how to manage it in a way that is functional for you. So, I'm sorry, did I say five parts? Four parts. So today we're gonna to talk about the first part, which is around surviving. And I wanted to just start off with just a couple of diagnoses, just because it it's helpful. I am not an expert in ADHD by any sense of the word. I am just a, an organizer uh, that just became really curious about what was happening to the brains of my clients. And I have done a lot of research. I have read a lot of books. I have attended a lot of seminars, um, but in no sense of the word do I have any degree in any sense to diagnose people or to, to really speak with any authority on the subject matter. All I do with my team is try to streamline the process and convert some of this everyday information to make people's lives a little bit easier. But ADHD is defined as attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And a few years ago, it used to be ADD and then they, they converted into just one 
diagnosis, which speaks to the people with hyperactivity and the people without it, which is considered inattentive type, uh, but they're all grouped into one category. And the inattentive type is basically the people that have a hard time with activation. And activation is how we start things. Like you wake up in the morning and you say, I'm going to write a blog post and you, a neurotypical person would sit down and brainstorm topics and resources and, uh, you know, maybe create a little, uh, outline of what the blog post would look like and they can sequentially figure out how to do it and they can start writing it and they can edit it and then they can finish it and however long it takes a neurotypical writer person to write a blog post where if you have ADD, you may get really bogged down on even getting started. Like what is the topic that I would be picking uh, or, you know, what is the resource I could use? Or there's a lot of ways that people have a hard time even getting started to do any task. And that, that is a very specific task, but it could be, it could be just as simple as like, you know, today I'm going to organize my office and not knowing where to get started or how to get started or getting completely overwhelmed by just the idea of organizing in your office so the book had a really good description about what is like to have ADD is ADD is like talking on a cell phone with a bad reception and I was like ah oh, I totally understand that concept where your brain is not very clear on what the message is and it's just really hard to understand it and it says that even if you had a perfect computer or the most expensive computer a well-built computer with the inability to process and store the amount of information you your desktop could get full um and something can always go wrong with your operating system so even in the best of brains um we can still experience that feeling of like overwhelm or of not getting the complete information i think i experienced that i don't have add uh, but i think i experienced that when i have lack of sleep i can i I feel a sense of fog in Israel when people are saying things to me. It feels like things are not completely connected and understanding or when I am completely overwhelmed. Mostly it happens when I don't get sleep. I can really understand the feeling of like, you know, this is what it would be like if my brain had ADD. There are a lot of things that impacts one's lives when they have ADHD. Uh, disorganization is at the top of the list uh, and disorganization has includes all aspects of people's lives and impacts their time management skills and impacts their ability to manage money and it impacts their ability to manage this stuff and if you really think about it there's so much of our lives that are included in those three things there's an emotional component to it is regulating our emotions and how we react to things their achievement has an impact on it i think underachievement also has to do with the workforce not understanding how ADHD works and not providing accommodation or resources for people to succeed. I see a lot of employers that get really frustrated with their employees. And then, you know, when if I worked in an environment where my boss was frustrated with me all the time, it would only be a matter of time before I had to leave and go work somewhere else. So there's a constant starting of new careers or changing jobs. And because there is no longevity in that process, that probably causes a lot of underachievement because you can't stay long enough to really make a mark or feel confident to you know get a better position or get promoted or things like that uh, there's a low level low level of self-esteem it's impacted by adhd and once again i think it's because if i felt that i was always late that i couldn't get anything accomplished that i couldn't finish my work on time that you know my boss didn't appreciate me i would start feeling bad about myself and of course it impacts a lot of relationships with others just because there's a level of inattention or hyperactivity there's a level of lateness so managing time is really difficult and uh, unfortunately for me like being on time is like a core value so i have had to like really work on my relationships with my adhd friends and i do have a lot of friends that have adhd uh, just because now i live in this world right you tend to attract more of those people in your life so i have had to really adjust my expectations about what it really means to be on time and how do we work that and how we manage that as friends and 
Um, you know, I do have a couple of friends that I literally have to call them and be like, okay, are you out the door right now? And then when they say yes, I'm in my car out the door, then I leave to go meet with them. And that's just an adjustment that I have made because I want to be friends with them. And so I had to learn how to, you know, change my expectations about what I meant to be on time so I didn't get frustrated. But if you are in a relationship with somebody like that, that can become a source of contention just because it's not just about having dinner. It's about everything that involves time management. And then there's depression that happens when you have ADHD. So some of it is like, you know, part of our biology. And some of it I think is also just based on the environment that causes all of this to be so overwhelming that it can set depression in. Uh, let's have some clients that spend an inordinate amount of time organizing, you know, they will spend all day Saturday and Sunday trying to catch up from the weekend. And that has a significant impact on their lives as well because they can't spend time with their friends or they can't spend time with their family or they're, you know, constantly frustrated by the fact they're not making any progress. So that is, uh, this is a, a significant stress for people. You know, and, and I think sometimes I meet with people and they're like, well, ADHD really doesn't exist. And I think we have come to a point where we can all say it does exist and it does have a significant impact to people's brains. And how do we accommodate for the people in our lives or how do we help them succeed in a way that, you know, makes them feel like we're all living in the same world. Over the years, I have learned that we live in a world that is meant for organized people which means that all of the people that tend to be a little bit disorganized, especially the people with ADHD, they got left into the, you know, into this side group that are not appreciated like we should. So my quest in those in the world is really to try to figure out a way to bridge that gap. And how do we do that is by understanding how other people think or how other people feel or how their ba brains react and that way we can all be on the same page. Recently, I was having a conversation with somebody and she was telling me how frustrated she was with this one mom on the PTA group. And I said to her, I said, well, have you considered that maybe she has like ADD or ADHD and she might not think like you do and then out of a sudden I felt like the light bulb went off right so I was able to have this conversation with one parent where she sought somebody else differently and then out of a sudden there was no longer this like resentment about this parent always doing something or not responding or not getting there on time or you know not being a very good carpool person sharing but all of it was just because that was something that she was not very good at. So this one person I was talking to kind of developed some same idea as I do with my friend. She would call and, and she would be the accountability person to help this parent get to the carpool on time and, and just be a little more, more accountable on her response. And they developed this beautiful, you know, accountability relationship where it, it really worked for them. One person was less frustrated and the other was more on time. So something to be said about that. So this book in the first part, mainly the, the focus is about organization as well, which I thought probably the part we should focus on, right? So the author says that I have learned that to be successful with ADHD, you must eventually restructure your life. And it goes with what I just said, that we live in a world that is completely formatted for the organized people. And in order to thrive in it, you can't work that way because that's not how your brain works. So you have to find a new version of your life that fits into the context of the world we live in. And it may include not being able to be in the closet, right? It may include the fact that you may have to share this information with your loved ones, with your friends, with your employer to figure out a way to live a new life in a new world that requires a little bit more flexibility on the social norms of organization. Women are one of the most undiagnosed group in when it comes to ADHD. And I think it's because mostly women are the inattentive kind. So from the outside, it looks like we are doing okay and just coping along where the truth is, is that we're doing a lot of accommodating in our brain to, to make it feel like we're hanging with our peers, but it's very stressful. A lot of our clients 
are kind of living in secret world, which is another reason why I wanted to talk about this book because I think there's so much commonality amongst them, but they're not talking to each other. Like it's like we're, you know, women are not sharing the fact that it's so stressful to be a mom, to work full time, to manage a household, to do all of the things that we are responsible for while having a brain wiring that doesn't allow us to just be structured in our schedule, that attention is difficult, that you know we're overstimulated. So I wanted to, to bring this, this book to light because I feel like whenever we realize that we're not the only ones about anything, right? Uh, whenever I read something in a book and I was like, oh my God, they wrote it in a book. <laughs> if they wrote it in a book, that means there's a lot more of us that have this exact same problem where we need the solution. And I think when, when you know, there's a lot more conversations about ADHD now than probably ever before. And I think that I appreciate that and a lot of my clients appreciate that. And I hope you appreciate that. So... ADHD is a full-time job for a lot of people and I think one of the interesting things that I see a lot is like husbands calling over here trying to fix their wives and the truth is is that you know your wife is expending a lot of energy and a lot of time trying to keep up and be like the other women uh, around her but the truth is is that that's not always a possibility so sometimes there's got to be accommodations to make that work and you know sometimes you have to hire services or create accountability systems or you know the division of labor has to be changed or um, you know so uh, I think paperwork and bill management is a really big deal for a lot of my ADHD clients and sometimes I say like, you know, is that something that your spouse or your partner or, you know, can you set up some good systems where you, you, you don't have to do that on a monthly basis? Like setting bills on auto pay. We do a lot of that for people. Setting bills on automatic bill payments so that, you know, their light don't get shut off and the water doesn't get shut off. I mean, I don't know how many clients we work with that do have the resources to pay their bills on time, but they just forget or the paperwork gets lost or there is no, you know, there is no automatic system for it. That is very shameful for a lot of our clients, especially when you get your lights turned off or your water turned off or, or things like that. So the truth is, is that your wife or your husband may be working really hard at trying to keep up and the systems are just not, you know, are just not set up the right way. There were a few false beliefs that I thought was really interesting that I'm going to mention. You know, I think most people that have ADHD are always feeling like there's something wrong with them. I think the majority of the clients I have would at some point in my conversation with them say like, I just don't understand why I can't or what is wrong with me or, you know, why is this so difficult or why can everybody do this and I can't. So much comparison to the people around them that are not ADHDers. And, and I think that it's a really difficult comparison, right? Cause your brain is just not wiring like the rest of the, uh, like the rest of the neurotypical people and to compare an apple with an orange and say like, you know, I wish that the apple would be, you know, juicier like an orange and why, why is this apple never going to be juicy? It's, it's a comparison that doesn't make any sense because an apple is always gonna be an apple and an orange is always gonna be an orange and you can't change that. So the first false belief that I see a lot is this I'm incompetent and it's just this, this comparison that we see between women, like why can't my friends do this and why can't I? Or why does everybody get places on time? Why can't I? Or why does everybody get their work, all of their household chores done on time and I can't. There's a lot of comparison that I just think it's out of place just because it's not it's not just the the way it works. Um I worked with a client the other day that had five kids and she had ADHD and two of her kids had ADHD and she had this massive house and she kept saying, "Why can't I just do all of my chores like the rest of my friends do?" And I kept thinking like because it's nearly impossible, even if you had a neurotypical brain, you still would have a hard time keeping up just because of the amount of things that you're responsible for. So uh, comparing yourselves to others may not be a good gauge of how you should accomplish things.
Uh, there's a lot of feeling that I'm immature, like when am I going to grow out of this? When am I going to get better at this? When am I going to, you know, grow out of it? And uh, unfortunately with ADHD, that's probably not going to happen. It's we, you know, I see a lot of our clients adapting and changing and getting support, but that's something that you always is always going to be there. Um, and Ned Hollow, Dr. Ned, Ned Hollowell says, balancing your checkbook should not be a measure of whether or not you're mentally healthy. And I don't know the last time that I balanced my checkbook. I kind of know how much money is in there, and I'm pretty good about knowing how much money there is or there isn't there, but balancing your checkbook, not a measure anymore. Uh, there's a lot of like, I'm an imposter, you know, and, and I think I see a lot of that where people are like, my house looks really decent from the outside, but every closet, every corner, every, you know, every drawer, every cabinet is completely stuffed and everything is a mess and I can't find anything and everything's so chaotic. And, and it is a little bit of a metaphor for like their outside, uh, for their outside life when, when they're inside of their, you know, their heads and their bodies, they're just feeling like a complete hot mess. I see a lot of that where, you know, people are just, they'll have like a tiny little pile on their desk and they'll just feel like this unsurmountable amount of clutter, but it's just really has a lot to do with what's going on on the inside of their body and their head. So if you're feeling completely overwhelmed, just, just try to figure out like, okay, where do I start? What do I need help with? because there there is a way that you can stop feeling like an imposter you know every drawer and every corner of your house doesn't have to be cluttered there's also a belief that if you try harder you'll get better at it and that is not necessarily the trick right sometimes uh i i see clients just really just over and over again trying to do things that are, are just not gonna work for them but they're just so set on like this is the standard of the world and this is how my friends do it and this is how the you know this is how i was taught by my organized parents on how to do things and it just doesn't work so it's not uncommon that i go into people's homes and just dismantle their system and just look at it differently a funny story about that i'm always reminded of is like uh, my sister came to visit me this was years ago and i was a brand new keurig user and she spent like four days with me and every day uh, she actually came to organize with me she was one of my first employees and she came and every day i would make coffee before we would leave out the door and i transfer from my um because you know keurig has a little stadium seating for your mug and i would put my mug in there i make the coffee and then i pull the mug out and then i poured it into my travel mug and like I think on the second day she was like what are you doing and I was like I'm making coffee and she's like you know this little piece comes out right and so she pulls the piece out and now I can stick my mug underneath it and that was like life-changing for me because I was like oh my god not only do I not have to use my mug anymore but I you know I reduced the amount of dishes I had to do because every day I was doing that and it was like it was transformation and it was such a small piece of information that just changed my life. And, and sometimes I think my clients with ADHD need that little moment where, you know, they have their version of the stadium, the mug stadium removal piece that is like, okay, if you just took this one piece out of the equation, it can just make your life so much easier. So I think having an outside perspective to what you're doing, the system that you're using can be extremely beneficial and you know you don't like you don't necessarily have to hire an organizer or a coach or you know talk to your psychologist or psychiatrist about it just maybe have a friend if it's not in your budget to work with someone have a buddy system like call somebody you know one of your friends to come over and like explain how your system works and maybe they can give you an outside perspective to it that may be helpful just make sure that the people that you're calling are not your super organized people call some of your medium organized friends right because they may have like they're not up here in their systems they're more like here on the their systems and they may be able to give you a perspective that is more usable for you and how your brain works the author talks about how disorganization is severely misunderstood and underestimated by 
millions of clients that have ADHD and I'm 100% in agreement with that. I think disorganization is such a big deal for people and it's such a big deal for their lives. And it's, you know, it's one of those things that people struggle. I would say it's something that would they struggle just as much as, you know, some people struggle with food. Disorganization is just as much of a burden for some people as it is for others. So if your friend or your husband or your wife or somebody's telling you how overwhelmed they are by their clutter, don't minimize it by saying, oh my God, you know, you're so organized or your house looks fine or just kind of like, you know, let them feel that pain and, and kind of help them through it. Because I think sometimes just being acknowledged for the way you feel about something is extremely helpful. The three biggest parts of person with ADHD has to do the, it, they call it the traditional triad of ADHD has to do with attention, impulsivity, and activity levels. So attention speaks to the need to have high levels of stimulation in order to focus. And I know sometimes that feels counterintuitive for people, but it has to be interesting, right? That is the high level of stimulation. Doing boring things is extremely difficult for people because it's hard to sustain focus. Impulsivity speaks to the shifting of activities and attention to activities. It can be very difficult to figure out what to do first. And once you're doing it, it can be very difficult to just sustain that attention and just keep doing it you know technology and all of the things coming at us has made it really difficult for any of us to have sustained focus unless we're literally shutting down from the world when you have ADHD that is a huge challenge for you know that's a huge challenge for my clients uh, one of my friends says <laughs> she says I selfishly appreciate now that the rest of the world understand what it felt like for me even before cell phones right because it's like complete distraction all the time but now we can see that through our phones and social media and whatnot an activity basically speaks to the level of like how much are you doing what are you doing how active are you how many things are you responsible for so when we have way too many things we are you know trying to focus in then we're all over the place and we can't focus on anything at all so organization is a huge deal for people with adhd and if you are struggling with that just remember that you know one you are not alone and two simplifying the system is always the best option i like to finish off with a quote from the author she says if you are a picasso kind of woman wear your bright colors and your bold shapes proudly don't hide yourself away behind a little smile and i would say don't hide yourself behind a fake smile right it's like if your brain is not wired like you know like your your best friend it's totally okay because your best friend can totally learn how to appreciate you just for what you are or for who you are or for the way you think um, the one thing i appreciate most about my adhd clients and friends is that they bring this level of perspective uh to conversations that you know, i would never i would never think of my own uh and my friend shelly always says um you know there are the contextual people and then there are the sequential people. I am very sequential. Things make sense on a linear basis. And then she brings these very, really, really colorful descriptions uh, to the conversation that makes so much sense to me. So we can learn how to partner and how to work well and how to develop a better relationships with the people in our lives that have ADHD. They're just always going to think about it differently. So this book is an amazing book. It's a great book if you are starting off on your journey of discovering your ADHD. It has multiple parts to it. Um, the first part and chapter five are mostly about disorganization and how it impacts you. It has lots of ways to understand people around you that you may never understood before. And hopefully you learn something that you didn't already know. Anyway, I'm Chris Gra with Organizing Maniacs, and you can find us at organizingmaniacs.com. And if you're interested, we have lots of other book clubs that you can look through and see what else we're talking about. Anyway, I hope you have an amazing day, and I will see you soon. Bye.